Hello, welcome to Pans and Pandas in the Classroom, Information for Educators. My name is Shara Verlan. I have 13 years of teaching experience and a year as an instructional coach. I have my master's in educational leadership and my license as a reading teacher. I resigned as an educator four years ago, right before my daughter was diagnosed with pandas. I was unable to work while I was researching this rarely diagnosed disorder while looking for treatment for my daughter. After she was diagnosed with PANDAS, my daughter entered kindergarten, and I immediately knew she needed extra support. This presentation is a summary of everything we learned as parents and as a former educator. I'm hoping to make the process of understanding your student and advocating for your student in an educational setting easier by bringing this information to you. Let's get started. So the outline for the presentation is as follows. We'll do an introduction to pans and pandas. What is a flare? You'll hear that a lot with probably with your families. We'll talk about the basal ganglia, symptoms at home and in the classroom. We will then go into a lot of accommodations and modifications that you can choose to have. Um, what an IEP or 504 may look like for our pans and pandas students. Any related services and then of course some ending ideas and notes. So I'd like you to imagine a normal, happy, verbal child turning into what appears to be a mentally ill, non-functional person nearly overnight. The trauma to the pans and pandas child and their family is profound and life-changing. So what is PANS? PANS is an acronym for Pediatric Acute Onset Neuropsychiatric Symptom Syndrome and is a diagnosis given to children who have a dramatic, sometimes overnight, onset of neuropsychiatric symptoms, including obsessions, compulsions, or food restrictions. They may have symptoms of depression, irritability, anxiety, and have difficulty with schoolwork. The cause of PANS is unknown in most cases, but is thought to be triggered by infections, metabolic disturbances, and other inflammatory reactions. What is PANDAS? PANDAS is another acronym, which stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorder Associated with Streptococcal Infections. It is characterized by the sudden onset of neuropsychiatric symptoms, specifically OCD or tics. Patients with PANDAS have been exposed to streptococcal infections or have had a strep infection. The onset of symptoms can be as late as nine months following an infection and or exposure as a seed in, seen in Sydenham's chorea and rheumatic fever. And often there is no longer evidence of strep at the time the patient is diagnosed. So this is what makes it quite tricky for, for families and for doctors sometimes. Like PANS patients, they also may suffer from uncontrollable emotions, irritability, anxiety, loss of academic ability, and handwriting skills. And PANDAS has just been classified as a subset of PANS. So what is a flare? You may hear this a lot from the families and parents of a PANS and PANDAS um, student. What this means is children can have recurrent symptom exacerbations or flares when exposed to other infections, as well as allergens and even stress. Some children suffer debilitating flares, while others function enough to continue to go to school, but not remotely at the same functioning level. PANS and PANDAS symptoms may relapse and remit. And during subsequent flares, symptoms can worsen and new symptoms may manifest. So next slide, we're gonna be talking about the functions of the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia are a group of structures found deep within the base of the brain. This is where inflammation is occurring in our kids. Basal ganglia are associated with a large variety of functions including motor control, cognitive coordination, and emotional functions. Subtle abnormalities occur in key brain structures of children diagnosed with PANS. So let's talk about the voluntary motor activities that you see in number one. Just as some background knowledge, to execute any type of movement, two things must happen at once. The muscles that initiate movement must contract, and the muscles that inhibit movement must relax. The basal ganglia controls that process. They are in charge of directing which muscles should activate 
in which need to relax. For example, to pick up a fork, you must extend your arm first, which means your bicep muscle cannot fire while this is happening. Otherwise, your arm would just contract. The basal ganglia, therefore, will send signals to your bicep telling it to relax. This allows you to extend your arm easily. Unfortunately, if an injury damages the basal ganglia, this normally harmonious process is disrupted. This can cause the muscles that initiate movement and the, and the muscles which inhibit movement to activate at the same time, leading to various movement disorders like chorea, which are some small random repetitive movements, um, may look like playing the piano or piano fingers, dystonia, which would be sustained involuntary muscle contractions that force people into abnormal positions. While the basal ganglia are primarily involved in movement, they're also connected to the prefrontal cortex. And since the prefrontal cortex helps regulate behavior, it seems that the basal ganglia may play a role in that as well. This explains why many people with basal ganglia damage or inflammation develop obsessive compulsive disorders. Some theories suggest that just as the basal ganglia inhibit certain muscles, it might also inhibit certain thoughts and behaviors. So again, the functions of the basal ganglia, we'll look at number two, regulatory. The basal ganglia has a role in cognitive and emotional regulation. When we think about cognitive regulation, the basal ganglia appears to be necessary for certain forms of implicit memory tasks. Now implicit means like unconscious or automatic. Like, um, like organizing behavioral responses and using verbal skills and problem solving. When we talk about emotional regulation, the basal ganglia plays a major role in mediating empathetic and socially appropriate responses. Damage or inflammation to this area is associated with irritability, emotional lability, which stands for like rapid changes in mood, failure to respond to social cues, and lack of empathy. And our last slide on the functions of the basal ganglia, we'll talk about procedural learning and routine behavior. Procedural memory, excuse me, is a type of implicit memory, again, that unconscious long-term memory, which aids the performance of particular types of tasks without conscious awareness of these previous experiences. Procedural memory uses past experiences to remember things without having to think of them. It differs from declarative memory or explicit memory, which consists of facts and events that can be explicitly stored and consciously recalled or declared. For example, procedural memory allows you to remember how to ride a bike, even if you haven't done so in many years. Some other examples would be like playing the piano, going skiing, ice skating, playing baseball, swimming, driving a car, and even climbing the stairs. The basal ganglia is important in language development as it allows a person to talk without having to give much thought to proper grammar and syntax. So now that we know the importance of our basal ganglia, we can start to understand how symptoms manifest at home and at school. So symptoms at home. In my opinion, as educators, it is beneficial for us to understand what is really happening and occurring at home. We can come to our learners and our families with a better understanding so we can, of course, support them. So here are some examples of symptoms that we would see at home. As you look through these, I just want you to remember that every Pans and Pandas student is different, and so they will not have every single one of these symptoms. They may, but not everyone does. Just a few things to just go over. When we talk about emotional liability as one of the symptoms, that, that describes rapid, often exaggerated changes in mood, where strong emotions or feelings like uncontrollable laughing or crying or heightened irritability or temper may occur. These are very strong emotions, and they're sometimes expressed in a way that is greater than the person's emotions. When we talk about um, enuresis, this would be involuntary urination, which usually occurs at night. It can happen during the day, but it does happen usually um, at night. So all of these things um, are symptoms that parents and families will see at home, and these are what our kids are dealing with on a daily basis. 
Uh, the, the first one, when we talk about anxiety or unusual fears, some typical fears that some of our pans and pandas kids have would be um, not being able to maybe use the bathroom, um, loud noises, fears of maybe going certain places in the house. Oftentimes, there's a lot of separation anxiety as well, where they're afraid to be away from um, a certain caregiver. So let's talk about some symptoms we may see in the classroom. So again, a manifestation. When we talk about manifestations, that means a visual representation, so what we actually will see within the classroom. In terms of behavior, we will see reduced attention span. Kids may look fidgety. They may have outbursts or poor impulse control. The inability to focus. You may see hyperactivity. You may see anxiety, including separation anxiety, which I alluded to before, from a familiar person. And also, I want you to think about, they might have separation anxiety from you as the educator. They, might not, they may not want to leave you to, let's say, go to recess or go to gym or go to out all the way down the hallway to the bathroom. So things just to consider. You may see OCD, immaturity, and age regression. For example, um, our daughter, who is nine, will sometimes revert back to when she was about three or four. You can hear in her voice and some of the how she deals with her her um, her friends and the teachers around her. You may see aggression and defiance in the classroom. In terms of physical uh, manifestations, uh, you may see tics or involuntary movements. There may be uh, frequent urination where they're needing to go to the bathroom a lot. You may see balance issues or abnormal gait. And we talk about abnormal gait, that's the way they walk and the way they move. Increased sensory responses. They may not like the light or certain sounds within, within the classroom. You may see that they have a learning disability or they've already been diagnosed with a learning disability, particularly in math and writing. Dysgraphia, sometimes uh, some of our kids have this, which is a neurological disorder of written expression that impairs writing ability and fine motor skills. It is a learning disability that affects children and adults and interferes with practically all aspects of the writing process, including spelling, legibility, word spacing, sizing, and expression. Some other things you might notice in the classroom is that sometimes our pans and panda kids have wide pupils especially within a flare. You may see a deterioration in fine motor skills and handwriting. Again, that would be more particular in a flare as well. They may have short-term memory loss and gastrointestinal complaints. I'd like to just go back to the balance and issues, balance issues in the gate. Um, consider um, some playground safety for these kids if that is an issue. And we'll get into that later. If they have tics and involuntary movements, their bodies may be sore. So be thinking about um, uh, about water for their throats if they if they're clearing their throat often maybe ice for certain parts of their body if those if they're moving those quite often like our daughter had a, a neck tick so her her neck was sore frequently. All right, so next is talking about the manifestations of pans and panda symptoms in the classroom, but specific to academics. You may see a decline in math and writing skills. For example, again, I'll, I'll just kind of bring up my daughter just because I have, we, I work with her every single day, but um, it just gives you an idea of what they deal with. Our daughter, again, is a third grader and she was working with multiplication and she was able to do, um, she was able to do like the associative property of multiplication for a couple of days. And then the next day she was not even able to try to figure out a, a simple addition fact, a simple addition sentence. Um, it's very frustrating and it makes her very angry. Uh, and then within two days, she was back to multiplication and adding really actually like three, like big numbers in her brain. Um, it just, just shows you what they go through on a daily basis. It's not very fun. Our kids may have poor short-term memory. They may have difficulty with working memory. And again, working memory is part of the short-term memory dealing with linguistic and perceptual processing. So these tests might include like holding a person's address while listening to instructions about how to get there or listening to a sequence of events in a story while trying to understand what the story means. So they may have some problems with that. 
They may avoid high sensory activities like art, recess, PE, and bathrooms. For example, art, some of the sensory things that happen in the art classroom may just be way too overwhelming for them. Recess, it might be the loud noises, many the, all the kids that are running around. PE, it may be, again, it could be balancing coordination issues, or it could be simple if they get really, really hot and they don't like that feeling. Bathrooms, again, it could be the issue of being loud. It could be an issue of germs that they have. There's lots of, and all kids are different, but, but they may avoid those high sensory ac activities. So we have to think about how can we accommodate for that. They may have difficulties with organizational skills. They ha may have work refusal. Sometimes our kids tend to be perfectionists or they're unable to focus. Here is an example of, again, this is my daughter who is doing a narrative uh, writing in second grade and it got to the time to the illustrations. One day she was able to do the, the picture on the left and then literally the next day this is the picture on the right and she was in a big flare. So you can see the difference of what she's capable of doing when she's not in a flare versus what happens when she was in a flare. Here's another example of this is not our daughter. Another example of writing and the inability to organize, to focus, the legibility of, of the handwriting as well. Here's another example. This is before, the one on the left was before symptoms had occurred and then on the right this is during an acute flare. And here's another example of spelling. The one on the left of course is just a regular old day and the one on the right is during a flare. So let's start talking about a 504 plan. Many children with PANS and PANDAS would fall into this category, unless of course it's a severe case. The 504 refers to the Section 504 in the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which prohibits discrimination of children with, with disabilities in schools. The 504 will modify the educational program within the regular classroom. To qualify, the disability cannot be temporary. For example, they just broke their arm, maybe they had surgery. Every child with PANS and PANDAS has a difference in their severity of symptoms, and sometimes schools may be too difficult. Sometimes school may be too difficult to attend and may require homebound instruction or virtual options. This is not a one-size-fits-all plan, of course, for our PANS and PANDAS children. So accommodations versus modifications. Here you can see the difference between the two. I'm certainly not going to be in the next slides be telling you as the professionals the difference between the two. I'm just going to be listing some ideas um, of things that you can use and then list in either your IEPs or your 504s for your students. Okay, so in terms of a 504 plan, you have educational goals. Here are some examples of educational goals you could consider for your PANS and PANDAS students. Reduce student stress and anxiety. Um, a plan for symptom exacerbation. What will we do if they're in a flare? What, what's our plan? And of course, you need to know your student really well. What are things that really bother them, especially during a flare? What do they need more support with? And then plan that in. Plan for less support when not in a flare. Plan for behavioral supports, sensory supports. Plan for student absences or tardiness. And a plan for student hygiene and classroom cleaning. During COVID right now, the classroom cleaning is amazing and it really benefits our kids so much as well as all the other students in terms of not catching the basic virus or flu. Okay, so some examples of things for your 504 or IEP. You can talk about having some calming strategies within the classroom. Um, all of these were suggested by our occupational therapist. And of course, as you look at this big long list of things, these are not going to work for every single PANS and PANDAS student. You really have to get to know what works for them. Our daughter loved um, scents in the classroom, where I know some other PANDAS and PANS kids did not like having any smells um, or aromatherapy within the classroom. It gave them headaches. It made them sick to their stomachs. So we really have to know our kids. Um, a lot of kids prefer the dim lighting. So we had our teachers brought in things that went over the lights, and if she was in a big room, they'd turn off lights in most of the room except for maybe one area. Of course, if we can't do that, we can provide a hat or sunglasses, just all these kind of things to make sure that they 
are in a calm situation as best as we can provide them. Rocking chairs, of course, speaking in a calm and low voice. We can even provide them earplugs. Our next slide has to do with sensory processing and heavy work ideas. Heavy work is a strategy used in therapy to target the sense of proprioception. Proprioception is, is responsible for helping our body understand where it is in space. For children with sensory processing difficulties, learning how to use the sense of proprioception to their advantage through heavy work activities can be especially powerful in helping them self-regulate, pay attention, and remain calm in a variety of situations. Heavy work is an activity that pushes or pulls on the body, but more specifically, our joints. And all of these things that I've listed here are things we can have in our regular classroom. And not only does it benefit our Pans and Pandas students, but it also benefits our other students as well. Again, you might look at this list and think, I can't have all these things happening in my classroom. But again, we just want to find one or two that maybe will work for our students. Okay, our next slide is talking about sensory deficiency supports. Because our pans and pandas kids may have some sensory deficiencies, it's helpful to have some sensory techniques and materials within the classroom. Of course, we can talk about flat, having flexible seating so they are comfortable, um, having an elevated writing surface. You may even consider some really cool like chalkboard writing or stamps or pencil in the Play-Doh, resistive tools, you could have a TheraBand on the chair, which is looks like an exercise band, but thick, and it goes around the legs and the bottom, and they can put their feet on it, they can push it and pull and bounce their feet on it, and it's quiet. You could, of course, have all the great seating options available, like bean bags and pillows and mats. Um, we can teach them belly breathing. Uh, we can have stress balls and koosh balls and puzzles and all these great things in the classroom. And we want to really consider the cognitive load and that is when the working memory system of the brain is overstimulated or overloaded. Working memory is an essential brain system for learning. A lot of things can create excessive cognitive load, which would be like too much information too fast. Um, and it results in poor emotional regulation skills. And thinking about our elementary schools, and I know I'm guilty of this, sometimes an overly decorated classroom is not the best for our students. Many brick and mortar classrooms um, are over decorated to the point of cognitive load. When a learner looks up from a screen or worksheet to reflect, mentally calculate, or construct an idea, their neurological processing is compromised with too much visual distraction right in front of their face. So some brain-friendly options in the classroom is all the posters that we want to have up for kids to access or your anchor charts Maybe consider hanging them on the, on the walls behind the Pans and Pandas students so right when they look up, they don't see that right away. Think about having small printable versions of posters and your anchor charts. Maybe they can take a picture of it with their iPad um, to create like a file within their iPad or even a paper file within their desk so your child can have a quick reference. Um, and that, of course, can happen for all the students if there's issues with, um, with the cognitive overload. Okay, so next would be some health-related supports we can provide within our 504 plans. Um, you can really consider having ice packs for overheating or sore joints. I know as our daughter came out of gym, she went straight to um, the freezer and got an ice pack on her way into back into the classroom. You can consider having a separate bathroom or a different time to use the bathroom if they're having fears of the bathroom um, or because of in terms of germs. Sometimes our kids are really afraid of those flushers that flush automatically, so just showing them how to use post-it notes to put it over the sensor really works for them and kind of eases some stress. Of course, teaching proper hand washing to our Pans and Pandas students, but for everyone in the classroom. Deep cleaning the tables and the chairs that they would be sitting in. Providing the water in the classroom is great. A change of clothing, that's an interesting one because we think about our kids who have some sensory issues if little things happen, like their, their shirt gets wet from washing their hands, or they get sweaty in gym, or something, their socks get itchy, just having that change of clothing to help them so they don't have to focus on what they're feeling and are, they're able to come back to the academics is really helpful. Um, notify parents of strep infections or other flus or viruses that are kind of happening in that grade level. 
give time to rest and that's okay. You'll get more from our kids if they're rested. Um, think about having nurse bricks where they can, they can do that. In terms of like germs, consider avoiding high trafficked areas if you can. If they need it, adaptive PE. And of course, because we talked about early about balance issues and coordination and their gait, maybe consider safety precautions on the playground so they don't get hurt and they're not hitting their head. And because of germs as well, consider separate, a separate set of materials for our Pans and Pandas kits. In terms of supports through the school staff, our school counselor was amazing and still provides so many things for our daughter. We had an occupational therapist that came in and was helping our daughter and, this, and, our, and our teachers. Um, they even trained a little a high school student that was next door to where our daughter was that was able to come in and help our daughter too. So there's so many things out there that can really help our kids. Um, the school counselor was helping with um, education, with coping strategies and social filtering skills and friendship skills. Um, and you can read the rest of these. Me Moves is a really cool um, activity that you can get online or you can buy the program, but it really provides focus for students and it can make them really calm and be ready to learn. I really think it's important to educate the school nurse on symptoms because sometimes our kids are going to want to go to the school nurse and they may talk to them about the headaches they're having, their tummy aches that they're having, that they're tired or that they're hungry. And sometimes a school nurse is someone they can really um, sit down and trust and talk with them about some of the things that they're feeling. Consider having excused tardiness or absence during their flares. Um, sometimes students have issues with getting distressed in the morning because of the way their clothes feel. So they may be late and having that be excused during their flares. Okay, so next is academic supports. When we talk about math and writing, we may want to provide extended time or less problems. Think about tools, tools for support for these students. Of course, utilize assistive technology like speech to text if you can. Because they may have issues with their writing, consider using graph paper. Really grade work on content and not their handwriting, especially during a flare. And again, consider grading and assessments when not in a flare. This is a tricky one. You may not know when they are in a flare unless you have really good communication with the parents, which I hope that you do. Um, but if you know they're in the flare, consider giving that, that assessment a couple days later because you're not going to get a true read of what they are capable of doing while they are in a flare. Some other academic supports would, for attention would be frequent breaks, again, extended time, less problems, some of these are repeats, um, alarm on a device for time management, flexible seating, or seating close to the teacher and away from distraction, to help with memory, thinking again about the calendars and lists and timers, using repetition and graphic organizers for the, these kids really helps. If they're a kid that has obsessions, allow a place to release those compulsions because they often will wait and they can get very, very irritable because they don't want to do them in front of people. Consider having a band on the wrist to snap to interrupt their ruminating thoughts if they have them. Of course, make sure that that's something as a family, with the family you decide to do that. Prompts to interrupt obsessions or even those ruminating thoughts. You can help them with that process. So here's an example of a 504 plan. This is the one that our daughter had. Again, we started this in kindergarten and it's really kind of morphed and changed as we got to know our daughter better as a student and with pandas. And then of course, as she got older, we had the educational goal, which we listed a lot of those before in the previous slides. Some of the intervention strategies or things that were going to help her. And then the person responsible, we had such a great team of, of people, our classroom teachers, the school counselor, our OT person, the school nurse, even our custodian was very much involved in making sure our daughter was um, safe and having the best academic day that she could. Here's another, the next page of her 504 plan. Again, there's all those educational goals. A lot of it, a lot of them was going around promoting positive mental health and physical well-being and making sure she was calm. And of course, school attendance. We wanted her to have a water bottle to rehydrate, keep her cool. That's really good for her brain too and these kids. Um, we had change of clothing at school. 
and we had education regarding coping skill strategies to help with her OCD, anxiety, and social filtering skills. They had a friendship skills group as well, which helped our daughter, but and then the students that were, were in there too with her. Another, the next page of her 504 looked like this. Of course, we wanted to keep our students as comfortable as possible. So we had the OT person come in and our daughter didn't need to have OT like on a regular basis. So she just really consulted on, on, on our daughter's case. But I know of other Pan and Pandas uh, families where OT is involved, you know, on a weekly basis with, with the student. Some, so here are some examples of things they can do. Our daughter preferred more of um, deep proprioceptive movement rather than pressure weighted, like the weighted and the blanket vests and things like that. She didn't like those. Uh, for her sensory issues, they had tents. We had ice packs. Our daughter did not like wearing socks or shoes, so they were like, oh, let's let her wear slippers, and I thought that was genius. And they are really, really open to a lot of things and our and, and our team was amazing to minimize student anxiety especially right now she is working virtually but they have her joining virtually um, to the classroom so she's able to have face-to-face -face time with friends and the teachers and so when she does hopefully get back to the classroom she's had time to to be with her her friends even though she's been away so some related services to consider is counseling. Maybe you need more one-on-one -on -one counseling or a counselor coming in from the county coming into the school. Audiology is a consideration. Any medical services. Again, having occupational therapy within the day. Um, orientation and mobility services. Of course, parenting, parent counseling and training would be amazing if that's something you provide in your school or you can get it from the community. Physical therapy. I, our daughter, daughter was in physical therapy uh, once once or twice a week, but that was outside of school. Um, it was really hard as a parent to be able to be doing all of these things. Uh, if you could get it within the classroom, my goodness, that would be great. Uh, school health services, the social worker, and of course, speech and language if needed. Okay, so just some ending ideas. How else can we support a student or a child with pans or pandas. I just want us all to remember as educators, the problem is pans and pandas, the autoimmune disease, it's not the child in front of you. When your student is really having a hard time in school, whether it be they're aggressive, they're irritable, they're just in a major flare, I think a lot of times that we provide validation and empathy and time, it will it will stop some of those behaviors um, and of course then brain ways, brainstorm ways to help them. For example, our daughter's name is Eliana so you may say during a flare if they're super irritable and just having one heck of a time you could say like Eliana I see you are angry. I know right now you're feeling terrible. I'm so sorry you feel this way. I'm here for you if you need me. So just giving that validation empathy and then give her time. Of course, then after that, you can brainstorm ways to help. And hopefully they'll be able to t tell you that, what, how it would help them, but sometimes just giving them time, then that's all they may need. And then we need to think about, is this a teachable moment or not? Is this something I need to push? Or is this something we can let go of? And of course, communication with families is huge. Report any changes to parents, whether it be behavioral, even eating habits, or academic regressions. Our last slide, of course, are the resources that I used to help with this presentation. The first one is the Foundation for Children with Neuroimmune Disorders. It's an amazing foundation and the website is amazing if you want to check that out. There's many resources you can use. I know this presentation went through a lot of accommodations. I hope this was not overwhelming. Remember, every pans and pandas child is different. Your particular student may need only five of the accommodations. I provided a huge list to reach all kids, but certainly you won't be using all of these. And remember, work as a team. You are not alone in any of this. The school counselors, the nurse, nurses, educational assistants, custodians, the occupational therapists, 
your art, music, and PE teachers all will work as a team. Thank you so much for listening and taking the time to educate yourself on pans and pandas. We appreciate all of the work you do for our children.